Welcome to Literary and Jury Charge Practice. Let's get started with a jury charge. Ready? Here we go. The fact that the person removed a bar from the property and entered onto the property showed that the person not only trespassed but assumed the risk of driving onto the property. The owner had the duty to exercise due care in keeping his property free from anything that would attract another onto his property. The fact that the bar was placed in such a way that it was meant to keep anyone from driving onto the property showed that the owner had exercised due care and diligence in preventing harm to another. However, the attorney for the plaintiff who was suing the property owner would argue that if there was a hazard on the property, namely a hole large enough for a car to fall into it, then the owner should have provided a bar that could not have been removed so easily because he indicated the hole on the property was so great that a sign should have been posted. He wanted to receive damages for the damages done to his car and to recover his hospital bills. The owner's attorney would argue that the defendant had taken all care to inform the public that there was to be no access to his property by placing a bar in the entrance to the property. He had taken due care in making sure that his property was sealed off. He would argue that the plaintiff knew the risk and assumed it anyway by removing the bar and driving onto the property. Whether the jury would rule in favor of the plaintiff or defendant would be determined by whether it was the defendant's place to have a sign posted that there was a hole on the property and whether it was the defendant's obligation to have a heavier bar that could not as easily have been removed. On the other hand, the jury would have to consider the question of trespass and whether the person had the right to enter onto the property of another and whether the plaintiff knew the risk and assumed it anyway. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you have heard the witnesses for both sides. Now you are instructed to consider the evidence that is before you. You have seen evidence presented. Now you must arrive at a decision of whether the defendant is guilty of negligence in this case. You have heard me describe what negligence means. You must apply the meaning of the term negligence. Now let's try some literary practice and this will be the article 
that we've been reading regarding mentoring. Ready? Getting ready to be mentored. Before you begin looking for a mentor, be sure to do some self-reflection about what you want out of the relationship and the kind of mentor who would be a good match. The following questions will help you clarify your needs and facilitate a good match with a potential mentor. What are your goals or challenges for which a mentor could help? How often do you want to interact with a mentor? For example, on a regular schedule or as needed? Do you have a preference for the geographic location of your mentor? How do you want to interact with your mentor? For example, email, in person, telephone, Skype, etc. Are there certain qualifications or experiences that you would like your mentor to have? Once you reflect on these questions, you can more easily communicate your needs to prospective mentors. Finding a mentor. You have decided that a mentor could be helpful and clarified your goals. So how do you go about finding a mentor who is a good match? There are two ways to identify potential mentors, informal and structured. Informal mentoring relationships happen when you meet an experienced colleague at a professional event or through interning and ask them to consider mentoring you to help you achieve your goals. This approach works best if you are comfortable attending professional meetings and engaging experienced court reporters one-on-one. -on -one. Alternately, structured mentoring relationships are those that are available from state court reporter associations as well as NCRA. With these mentoring relationships, you will typically submit a request via the website and be matched with a potential mentor. Formal programs such as the NCRA virtual mentor program often try to match mentors and mentees based on criteria such as geographic location. Barcume explains mentees can benefit from a mentor who is in the same geographic area and knows local formats. My mentor sent me the files she used which saved me time. Whatever approach you use, it is useful to have an exploratory conversation with a prospective mentor to learn more about each other. During this conversation, you will also communicate your needs and goals. Ideally, the potential mentor will be a good match. However, it may be that the prospect is not a good fit. In this case, you might consider asking that prospect if he or she knows others who might be a better fit. All right. Get back to some jury charge practice. Ready?
you must further decide whether there was an element of trespass involved. You have heard me describe what trespass is. I will again repeat that trespass involves entering on the property of another, not as an invitee, but as someone not invited onto the property. You must examine the evidence and decide whether this term applies to the defendant. You must decide whether a reasonable person would have acted as the defendant acted under similar circumstances as in this case. You must not rule out recovery to the plaintiff. If you find that he was himself negligent, you must consider what I told you was the rule of law in this state. The rule of law in this state is based on comparative negligence, not to be confused with contributory negligence. You must not rule out the defendant because you find that he is in any part negligent. The law states that in comparative negligence, the negligence of both parties shall be considered rather than the sole fact of whether or not the defendant contributed to any portion of the negligence. That means that you must consider the negligence of both sides. In comparative negligence, the law states that the plaintiff can recover. If the negligence of the plaintiff is less than the negligence of the defendant, the plaintiff can recover the portion of which he was not negligent. You must determine whether there was negligence and whether it was less than the negligence of the defendant. In contributory negligence, the plaintiff is not allowed to recover if it can be proved that the plaintiff had any part in contributing to the negligence. It is important in these cases that the plaintiff be not negligent at all. This is not the rule of law in our state. You can consider the fact that the plaintiff was negligent and not bar him from recovery. If the plaintiff is negligent alone, then the plaintiff cannot recover. You must decide whether this was the case. You must decide how negligent the plaintiff was if the plaintiff was negligent. It is now for you, as jurors, to decide and rule out recovery for the plaintiff if you feel that the plaintiff has contributed more to the negligence. All right, let's get back to our our literary about the rodeo. Ready? It turned out to be a very fun day. Sometimes it was hard to understand the announcer on the public address system, but I was able to get enough so RT knew who was in the arena and what was going on. Sometimes people would stand around us talking and yelling to friends, also making it hard to hear the announcer 
so I'd write what I could hear the people yelling. Equal access, right? The good and the bad. A lot of people also wanted to know what I was doing and why was I recording the rodeo. It turned into a really good opportunity to promote captioning and court reporting. There were barrel races, bull riding, steer roping, a parade, and even a goat dressing contest. Yep, you read that one correctly. At a signal, two people would run to the goat and one would hold the goat while the other had to put underpants on the poor, adorable goat. The teams were timed, and whoever had the best time was the winner. It may sound easy, but it was amusingly difficult. It didn't help that the goats were not at all happy with being on display in such a way. And then, just like that, it was all over. The events were done, and it was time to leave. Boy, the time sure went fast, but I was also wiped out and ready to be home. Listening and performing all day is hard work. Would I do it again? You bet. And next time, I won't worry so much. For this job, I already know what to wear. That was a fun one. All right. A little more literary. Let's get back to our article about mentoring. Ready? Interacting with your mentor. Assuming you found a good match for a mentor, how should you interact with him or her? One of the most important ways you can successfully work with a mentor is to take ownership of the interactions. Some specific strategies you can use include the following. Establish an explicit contract at the beginning of a mentoring relationship. Excellent mentoring relationships begin with alignment between a mentor and mentee about the goals of the relationship and the various process associated with working together. While it is not necessary to write a formal agreement, it can be very helpful to clarify certain issues at the beginning of the relationship. For example, how often will you meet and using what communication channel? For example, email, in person, telephone, Skype, etc. Who will initiate the communication? What is the overall agenda for each call? What are the boundaries related to confidentiality of the information you share. What happens if a crisis emerges and you need to cancel a meeting? How much notice do you need from each other? If the mentoring relationship is not working out for you or your mentor, how will you handle it? Follow through on your commitments. Mutual respect is a key ingredient of strong mentoring relationships. Mentors are here 
are there to support your success as a new court reporter. As part of their role, they may likely provide advice and suggestions. One way you demonstrate respect is listening to your mentor's suggestions, maintaining a positive attitude, and taking action on the commitments you make. By taking action, you are communicating your respect for your mentor and his or her professional wisdom. By doing so, you are establishing a positive reputation for yourself in the profession. All right, on that note, we will finish this up another time. That will conclude our literary and jury charge practice.